Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is one of the healthiest conversations you're going to hear all day, a special episode of the exam room live here. And I'm so excited because we have with us today a super fit superstar. He is an actor. He is a supermodel. He is a film producer and a self-described tree lover and running person. And with that, we welcome Millen Soman to the exam room live. My friend, thank you so very much for making the time. Thank you, Chuck. Great to be here. And where, where, are, the, conversation. And where, where are you today? Where in the world are you today? I'm in Mumbai, India, and it's about uh, eight o'clock in the evening. So eight o'clock there as we go to air here, it's 1030 in the morning on the East Coast here in the United States. And joining me also today on the East Coast is our very own Dr. Zishan Ali. Dr. Zishan Ali, my friend, so good to see you again as well. Same here, Jack. Good to, good to have uh, Melin Soman, our film actor and fitness enthusiast. And Chuck, I'm always amazing to have you. Oh, my friend, you know, when you sent me an email and you were like, hey, do you want to talk to Millen? I was like, yeah, he's got this incredible story. And then you sent me even more information. And then literally just 30 seconds before we go to air, Millen tells me, he's like, hey, make sure we talk about how my weight hasn't changed in 35 years. So this is actually where I want to start with you, Millen. 35 years. Most of us go up the scale. We go down the scale. We go up. We go down. But you for 35 years have stayed consistent. What is your secret? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's just regular good habits. You know, I've I've met so many people, especially in India, you know, we don't really have a tradition of exercise or sport or a healthy lifestyle. We don't really look at it that way. And so I see uh, people all the time who on an average have put on about 20 kilos uh, from the time they leave college till the time they uh, steady in their jobs, it's like an average of 20 kilos that they put on. And sometimes I meet people who say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really leading a healthy lifestyle now. And I've lost 60 kilos. And to me, it seems unbelievable. You know, I, to me, the question is not how they lost it, which must be very, very hard work. But to me, the question is, how did they put it on? I mean, where were they looking? You know, I, I, uh, probably was in a better space because I, I I was in competitive sports from a very young age, from the age of eight or nine. I was I was swimming. I've represented India in swimming as well. I've, I've represented my state for about 14 years. And then I, um, I, I studied, of course, to be an engineer, but then I got a lot of great offers to be a model and I, I took them up and I traveled all over the world. And to be a model, then you have to kind of take care of the way you look. Right. So it was about looks for a bit. And then I discovered marathon running at the age of 38. And uh, it was just an off chance. I said, let me do run one marathon because, you know, I'm Indian. I didn't know anything about marathon running. But I said, let me do one because it was a new thing in India at that time, almost 20 years ago. But it kind of uh, I got hooked uh, to it and I started running regularly. I started really uh, paying attention, uh, more attention, I would say, to the kind of things I was eating, how much I was eating, when I was eating, uh, stuff like that. So I think it was just awareness, you know, just being self-aware of wanting to feel a certain way rather than look a certain way, because modeling actually happened to me by chance. Um, I always wanted to feel uh, great, feel fantastic, feel like I could do anything that I wanted to do in my life and that my health or my fitness shouldn't stop me. I was always in that space. So I think uh, I was always a little aware of uh, how fit I was, how healthy I was, how my body was functioning. And I think it was, it was that that kind of kept my weight uh, in check. I never thought of it like that, that I wanted to be a certain weight. In fact, even today, I feel that as a marathon runner, I should be lighter. I'm about 80 kilos. Um, you can uh, translate that into pounds because I think that's how you, you look at things. But I would like to be like, 75 and <laughs> nobody's ever happy with where they are but uh, it's not happened so i'm 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 happy with it uh and i think the important thing to know is that i my weight hasn't changed like i mentioned to chuck uh since i was 19 and i'm now i'm 56 and uh looking at the way that it for, for a lot of people you know your weight just goes up and down and it seems so difficult to control it that i thought it was an interesting point to make 
Yeah, you, that is a very interesting point to make. And I think that the fact that you have stayed so consistent is what makes you an inspiration, somebody that a lot of people can look yeah. up to. But Zeeshan, let me ask you this. It wasn't too terribly long ago on the show that you and I were talking about obesity trends in India. And what you were telling me is they are they are shooting <laughs> up. They are skyrocketing right now. So really, you look at somebody like Millen, he truly is the exception to the rule, unfortunately, correct? That's so true, uh, Chuck. Uh, definitely, what we are seeing is that we are seeing diabetes and obesity and heart disease rates are rising in India. And I think we have to see even what we are eating. So our diet has become more westernized and we have gone so far away from our traditional Indian diet made of lentils and grains and legumes and vegetables. And when I was watching Milan's interview a few, few weeks back, and I see that sometimes he can like just eat fruits in his breakfast. So people like him are amazing role models for us to show that we can definitely stay fit and, uh, and uh, eat healthy. And we can really fight the rate of diabetes and obesity in India. Let's go ahead and talk about that menu, what it is that you're eating throughout the day, Millen, if you don't mind. So let's kind of start with, with breakfast. Walk us through. Zeeshan just said that you like to eat a lot of fruit for breakfast, but what was today's breakfast? So today's breakfast would have been a, a, a whole papaya and a, an entire watermelon. That's what it, what it started with. So for me, it's... Uh, I do eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. I try to, to have a lot of that in my diet. Uh, I know those are not popular choices for most people. But what I want to also point out, as Zishan mentioned, you know, our diets are becoming, in a certain section of our society, diets are becoming more westernized. And not only that, because of the affluence, you know, a lot of Indians are becoming more affluent. They're becoming more, uh, they have more uh, disposable income. And I think we are then uh, eating richer food, you know, not what our staple Indian diet is. If you travel across the country, you know that Indian, there's not one kind of Indian food. There are a hundred different kinds of Indian food. Every state you go to has a different kind of food. If you go to the south of India, you'll see different food. You go to the north, you go to the west, you go to the east. And the staple diet, the traditional, I would say, staple diet is actually very, very healthy, very balanced. You have all the things that you need to eat are in, in the plate. But what is happening is when Indians started to have more disposable income, so that's why I mentioned it's in a, probably in a particular level, a particular section of society. We've started eating what we used to eat at celebrations, you know, what we used to eat at festivals, what we used to eat at functions. We are now beginning to eat that every day. And obviously that's not very good. The simpler the food you eat, the better for you. So now to tell you after fruits, then of course, uh, if I'm if I'm still hungry, I have some cereal, which is Indian cereal. I don't really eat corn, uh, corn, uh, corn flakes or oats. I go for the Indian cereals like millets and so on. And also, uh, when I have lunch, my lunch is um, is something that in India we call khichdi. Now, every different area, every different region or state of India has its own version of this dish called khichdi. And what khichdi? Uh, Generally, is it's rice and lentils mixed together and cooked together with some vegetables. So my version of that is, of course, rice and lentils with a lot of vegetables. I say one third rice and lentils and two thirds all kinds of seasonal, seasonal and local vegetables that are available in the market. So that's what my my staple diet is. I have khichdi uh, every day, sometimes even twice a day. So I I do eat a lot of rice. I eat very little wheat. Uh, I eat a lot of lentils and I eat a lot of vegetables and a lot of fruit. So these are the four things that kind of uh, make up everything I eat. And Zishan, so when we, we hear Millen talk about that healthy diet, what do you think would happen to the obesity trends if everybody there were to shift their diet back to what it is that Millen was just describing there? I would imagine that with the rate of obesity going up, that would plummet, but so too would the increased number of cases in diabetes and heart disease. That's so true. I think this is what Millen has just mentioned. If we really uh, take his words, and it is coming from somebody who has shown you for 35 years how to be fit and active, and he has summarized it in everything that our diets, if what we were supposed to eat once in a month, now we are eating it every day. 
if we just exactly. focus on basic simple foods like what Milan has mentioned, like khichdi, I mean khichdi is such an amazing thing. Combination what he said, rice and lentils. So these foods, if we bring back to the center of our plate, then I'm definitely sure that diabetes, obesity, heart disease, hypertension, blood pressure, even arthritis, and even migraine, and even hormonal problems that we are facing now will go away because this kind of animal based food is so highly inflammatory and we avoid this we go simple basic foods from grains legumes fruits and vegetables we can definitely fight all these chronic disease problems in india and because we are just avoiding these high caloric dense foods which are which will increase your cholesterol and your uh, lipids in your bloodstream and everything you see that you start reversing everything once you uh, change your diet, and we have seen results in as quick as four weeks to eight weeks, people have stopped their medications with diabetes and heart disease. Yeah, and, and that's something that I think a lot of people still don't realize is just how big of a role diet plays in their health. Obviously, you know, if you eat junk food, you're going to gain weight. But where, what are the ramifications beyond that? That's what people still um, need to be educated about, just in, in my opinion. Um, but we do have, Millen, a lot of questions about your diet still pouring into the chat right now. A lot of people are very curious about this. So here's kind of a fun one. Uh, you mentioned kitchery. Uh, a a few yeah. times, uh, if you could eat just one traditional Indian plant-based meal for the rest of your life, would it be kitchari or would it be something else? It would be kitchari. I love, <laughs> I love kitchari. And sometimes people tell me that you know, oh my God, that's so boring. How could you possibly eat that all the time? And and the thing is that you're eating all kinds of different vegetables. And like I mentioned earlier, all the vegetables that are available, which are seasonal and local. So when I say local, I travel a lot and whatever uh, vegetables are available locally in the place that I'm at, those are the vegetables that go into my kitchen. And of course, vegetable change, vegetables change according to the season. Fruits change according to the season. And I think if we eat seasonal and if we eat local, we, we are naturally uh, eating more healthy. So that's uh, that's something I would say. I mean, kitchen is is a staple. That's That's my diet. What about what about you, Zishan? I'm just curious. What would be your one meal if you could have just one? Oh, I think I, first of all, I have to mention this. Check the way you are saying kitchari. It looks like you are an Indian. <laughs> well, thank, <laughs> thank you, thank you. That means a lot coming from you, my friend. Thank you. Made my yeah. day. Million and, uh, and me, we, I think we have to feed kitchari to you one day, so we have to invite you. Oh, oh I'm I'm on board, my friends. Let's all get yeah. together and have some. Yeah, so my wife, what she does is uh, she makes a dal. And, and dal is just like we have, you know, different types of lentils. lentils. So she yeah. combines four different lentils and make yellow dal. And what she does is what she does an amazing mm -hmm. thing with the, the dal is that after cooking it and everything, she will take a piece of coal and she will uh, burn it like a red hot coal and she will put it in the in a small katori on top of this dal and she will cover it so that 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 aroma of that coal will make that dal seem so tasty so i can eat that dal with my chapatis and brown, brown rice every single day uh text me your address oh. so i can be there within the hour <laughs> Um, Millen, question for you, my friend. Are you are you big on snacks? A lot of our viewers are very fond of snacks. Do you snack throughout the day? Um, I do actually. I I I. So my thing is, I eat whenever I'm hungry. You know, I if I feel like snacking, I snack. Uh, even the um, the quantities that I eat for lunch and dinner and breakfast they vary because uh, it depends on how hungry I am what I've done the previous day, how did I sleep? I mean, there's so many things. I don't have a very rigid uh, kind of routine. Uh, I don't count calories, uh, for example. But because I believe more in body function, that your body is definitely uh, the master when it comes to deciding what is best for you, um, if it's functioning well. And I think if you have the right amount of uh, uh, exercise, the right sleep, the right... Uh, um, what do you call it, stress management uh, philosophies, then your body can actually function well enough to, to tell you what you need to be eating. 
so that's that's what I follow. If I have to snack, I snack. I I I in fact eat whatever's in front of me. <laughs> in fact, people ask me because I'm largely vegetarian. Uh, they ask me about uh, protein, you know, and I'm sure this question comes up a lot uh, with all of you. That you know, where do people who are largely vegetarian get their protein? And if I'm running so much, I just did a run from uh, Mumbai to a place in Gujarat that is about almost three or four hundred kilometers away in a week, and they say, "How do you do that?" on this kind of a diet and um, of course i do eat non vegetarian food but again it's it's only for taste i don't eat it for nutrition i don't need eat it because i want protein i think i get enough protein from from the kind uh, kind of food that i eat uh, that is vegetarian food so um if i if i feel like snacking and there are peanuts i eat peanuts if there's i mean anything else i mean whatever there is to snack <laughs> I, i can't really really say it could be anything i mean it's not that i don't eat chocolate i eat chocolate i eat i, I eat pizza i eat uh, i mean really anything because to me if my body is functioning right it will take what it wants and discard the rest and that is that is the truth for me and it's been like that since i was a child yeah, speaking of chocolate i think that i saw somewhere online that you used to eat about a a quarter kilo of chocolate every <laughs> single day that's a lot of chocolate yeah it's a lot of chocolate and not only that i have a sweet tooth i love sweets i i've grown up loving sweets and so apart from the quarter kilo of chocolate i used to have a shelf in my bedroom that was just full of chocolate boxes from all over the world you know and like i used to love uh, eating chocolates all the time and uh, apart from that i used to have dessert with every meal and uh, um sometimes my meal was dessert <laughs> was, crazy, but the thing is and maybe it's because of the kind of active lifestyle that i've always had uh maybe that was okay but i think it it was an extreme and i think that the kind of things that your body can actually deal with and the kind of things that is it's wise for you to do changes with age and i definitely feel a difference from when i was 25 from the time i was 35 and 45 and 50 and now of course when i'm 56 i feel we really have to be aware of what activities are best at the particular age we are at what food is best for the particular age we we are at and even uh, more importantly than that our indian philosophies teach us like ayurveda also teaches us that food impacts even your creativity it impacts your mood it impacts the kind of person you are your response to situations so it's not just about calories and nutrition it's even about being the kind of person you want to be of course that is a little bit deep and you know you need to really study yourself and study uh, the kind of food you're eating and that takes a lot of effort and a lot of time but it is the truth i i sincerely believe that i i know that food changes the way i sleep at night like if i eat a particular kind of uh food in the night i don't sleep well if, if i eat a particular kind of food i i really sleep uh, wonderfully and i wake up refreshed so people need to pay more attention to what they eat not just hear that oh you need 56 grams of this and 46 grams of that and your weight is this much so you need 2 grams of protein i mean that is at one level simplifying it too much and at level and at another level you really need to find out for yourself what is best for you zishan i want to come to you uh, this is a great question that just came in from plant based culture at 1047 wondering about eating a large variety of food so that you do get all of those nutrients and not necessarily as as melon was alluding to not eating you know so much of this and so much of that just going for that large variety what's your opinion on that of course jack yeah i think uh, this is definitely important so when i'm uh, giving lectures and i'm talking to people uh, giving lectures in schools or uh, in universities so what we are saying is focus on this power plate grains legumes fruits and vegetables bring lots and lots of color in your food because that's where uh, this variety comes from when you have different kinds of colors and the antioxidants you have in those different kinds of fruits and vegetables that's definitely it's more tasty there's a variety you get variety of nutrients you don't have to worry about about your protein or calcium needs because those all will be easily satisfied if you are eating a variety of uh fruits vegetables grains and legumes just bring like for example there's different types of grains available so not not just eating on one type of grain but different type of grains so variety variety is always good for you different colors good for you and eating uh you know just what is grown from earth 
uh, try to focus on that and that is uh, that is the best uh, food for you Millen, question uh, for you. This one comes to us from Nidia at 1044. She wants to know, do you crave foods like samosas and cakes? And if you do, how do you manage those types of cravings? So, like I mentioned earlier, I have a sweet tooth. I love sweets. But I think what has happened is uh, over a period of time, because I've been so conscious of what is good for me and what isn't, and when I should eat a particular kind of food and how much I should eat. So it's not a question of actually restricting myself or saying I can't have uh, this. It has become a kind of consciousness in itself that when I see maybe three or four different uh, options on things to eat, I will automatically choose uh, what is good for me. It, it, but that happens over time and I've noticed it happening with me over time. And that is why today I don't have that shelf uh, full of chocolate in my bedroom. In fact, I very rarely eat it. I don't say I don't eat chocolate. I do. But uh, the craving comes to me very, very rarely. And when it does, I don't, uh, I don't stop myself. But again, I know that it's just that taste that is something that I crave. I don't crave to eat 200 grams of chocolate. That doesn't enter into it at all. It's just the taste that I crave. So I should know that once I've tasted it, that part of my brain that has been craving it should be satiated. And so, of course, I enjoy that taste. I spend time with that taste and then I don't eat as much uh, as I used to. Let's uh, switch gears here and talk a little bit about uh, your fitness. You've mentioned that uh, you're the Ironman competitor. So, um, Zishan, <laughs> I, I know that this is something you're very passionate about as well. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to ask you just flat out, for those of us who aren't Ironman athletes, we're always so fascinated about what the training routine looks like. So what does your training routine consist of? So my training is like my food. It's very fluid. It's, uh, there's no routine. There's no regimen. I, do, I hate waking up early in the morning. Uh, unlike, I think, a lot of athletes who, especially runners, I've noticed they like to run at 5 o'clock in the morning or 6 o'clock in the morning. I run at about, and because I can, I'm privileged, I can run at about 11 o'clock in the morning. I love the sun. I love the heat. Most uh, people that I know don't like uh, uh, running in the heat. Uh, and I, I create my own uh, training programs. If I have a particular goal, if I were to run a marathon, if I were to do an Ironman, I've also done Ultraman. Uh, I, sometimes I, I like to run on the highway from one city to another city. Then I know because of the experience that I have over a period of time, the experience that I've gained is how much I actually need to do. For example, when I, when I did Ironman when I was 50, that's in 2015, I asked a friend of mine who had done Ironman several times. Uh, I said, you know, give me a training program. You know, I need to get ready for this event. What, what do I do? I hadn't swum for about 25 years. I hadn't cycled since I was a child. But I was running regularly. So for people who don't know, the Ironman is a, a 3.8 kilometer swim followed by 180 kilometers on the cycle and followed by a 42 kilometer full marathon. So she sent me a 35 hour a week program. And I, I wrote back to her and I said, and she was American, uh, a fabulous athlete, uh, sent me this program 35 hours a week. I said, listen, I can't do this because I have a life. You know, I, it, it's not that I, I, Iron Man is everything to me. I want Iron Man to be part of my life. I want to, fitness to be part of my life. I don't want it to take over my life. So I don't have 35 hours. Tell me, is there something shorter that I can do? I don't want to win Iron Man. You know, I just want to complete the distance in the time, get the Iron Man title. So then she sent me a 25 hour a week program. And I said, listen, I can't do this either. This is still five hours a day, five days a week. I don't have that kind of time. So then finally, I had to create my own program, which was 14 hours a week. And for me, the 14 hours was divided uh, for the weekend. Uh, the weekend, I did about six or seven hours. So I just had to do another seven or eight hours during the week. And by doing that program, I was able to complete Ironman uh, successfully. So I think, again, it's a matter of, uh, of really spending time with yourself, understanding your body over a period of time, not being in too much of a hurry. Even if you have a goal for something you want to achieve in life, take it slow, learn about your body and your mind. And eventually, if you're regular and you keep putting one foot in front of the other, you are going to reach where you want to reach and in the safest possible way. And 
Zishan, I want to come to you next because this is something that, you know, you were super passionate about and you had a million and one questions uh, for Millen uh, about his fitness, man. So I'm just going to kick it over to you to to ask whatever it is that you want to that you want to ask. Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chuck. Because I, th I thought when with you there, I will I, I have no chance. But thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so yeah, Milan, I think uh, what I would like to know from you is that I know you uh, you have done a lot of barefoot running. Yeah. And uh, I really want to see how you, how you have done it because this is something I cannot imagine doing that. Not even like a point 0.1 mile. How can you do it for long runnings barefoot? Well, the first thing is I wish I could show you my feet because they're really pretty. <laughs> and I'm not being sarcastic. A lot of people think that oh, barefoot runners have the ugliest feet and they've got corns and calluses and things like that. But the first thing I want to say is that your body understands. So I'm, I'm a big person for, you know, your body. My body understands a lot more than my mind does about a lot of things. And your, your body knows that your skin needs to be supple. Corns and calluses are not something that the body should have. And so the body understands that. So when you are... Uh, when your feet get conditioned to running barefoot on different kinds of surfaces, your skin will remain soft. It will remain supple. It might the thickness of your skin might just increase by a few microns, which and a skin we know is really really tough, you know. But it's not going to be hard. It's not going to be calloused. It's not going to be uh, not going to have corns if you're doing it correctly. But how I started was uh, again as an experiment with myself. One day about this is more than ten years ago. I was running. I had just finished a 20 kilometer run in the hills and I, like, my feet were very tired. And I said, let me just see what it feels like to run in my socks. I don't know why I just thought that. I, I took off my shoes. I ran for about half a kilometer in my socks. Of course, my socks were ruined. But in some way, my feet felt refreshed. My feet felt rejuvenated after I took them out of my shoes and I started running uh, in my socks. And I thought that that was really interesting. So I started running longer distances barefoot. Of course, I looked for very clean roads with no gravel, um, you know, very smooth, with nothing pokey, because my feet were very, very sensitive in the beginning, really sensitive, because as we know, our fingers and our, our hands and our feet, these are the, this is what we use to kind of suss out the environment, you know, to see how we are going to respond to the environment. You know that you you can't really use your, your hands well if you're wearing thick gloves. You know, your hands need to feel stuff. The same way your, your feet need to feel the ground that the body has to know how to respond to the surface. That is what I discovered. I discovered as I started running longer and longer distances that my the way I was running completely changed. My posture, my, uh, my coordination, my balance, my cadence, everything changed. The muscles that I was using to run completely changed. And this is after running for 10 years. I, it was like my body was relearning how to run because it could finally feel the surface it was running on. That was that was something that was amazing. But uh, I must tell you that if you if you plan to run barefoot and you've been in shoes all your life, then you need to take it very, very slow. As I said, one is that your feet are very sensitive. Two, that you're going to start using muscles that you didn't use before. So you need to get those muscles engaged very, very slowly. Otherwise, they will get injured. So to give you an example, I was already a full marathon runner when I started running barefoot. It took me one and a half years to build up to half a marathon again barefoot. It took me another one year to build up to a full marathon barefoot. So two and a half years after I transitioned because I had built it up so, so gradually. I never had any problem. I never had any injury. And I'm so happy now that I run barefoot. I still, I still don't recommend it. Because, you know, people will just tell me I'm going to ruin a lot of people's lives. So I don't do that. I just do what I do. And I, I urge people to experiment for sure. You know, you remind me of uh, a gentleman by the name of Shoeless Joe Jackson. He was a famous baseball player in the early 1900s here in the U.S. And there was actually a film kind of based on him uh, called Field of Dreams that was released about 30 years ago. But the story with that yeah. is, you know, when he was playing in the minor leagues at one point, he had a new pair of spikes and his feet hurt so much by the middle of the game that he just he took off the cleats. And for the remainder of the game, he just played in his in his bare feet. And so the name Shoeless Joe stuck with him throughout the rest of his career. But I'll be daggone if he wasn't, uh, you know, playing at his best for that second half of the game when he was. 
in fact, uh, shoeless. Um, Zishan, let me come to you really quickly here. We have about five minutes remaining in our conversation. Um, you hear about all of the Ironman athletes who do eat a plant-based diet. And you know, to be an Ironman competitor, it takes an enormous amount of energy, an enormous amount of calories. But talk to me about how you can still get adequate nutrition being such an elite athlete while eating a plant-based diet. Of course. Uh, so I think uh, like Milan is one example. And then our director at Bernard Medical Center, uh, James Loomis, and at Milan, I think I should introduce you to him. He recently did the Iron Man and he is completely on plant-based diet for years. So I think and there is so much data and research studies published that plant-based diet is, uh, uh, if appropriately planned, the, uh, sorry, let me reframe this. If plant-based diet is planned well, then it is adequate for all ages of life, even for pregnant women, even for athletes, even for kids, and even for older people. So that means the nutrition is definitely there. You don't have to worry about it. For people like athletes, and we have examples of Serena Williams and Venus Williams and Scott Jurek, they have done ultra marathon and they are like the powerhouse of everything. And this new movie, Game Changers, that has really changed the way people think that plant-based diet is actually is complete diet and actually because it is so less because it is not inflammatory something like the animal based protein is highly inflammatory and plant-based diet is the opposite so it heals it is it has the healing power so more and more athletes and ultra marathon uh, ultra marathon people and more and more people who are doing like really rigorous exercises we are finding enough evidence that that plant-based diet is actually providing all the nutrition they need and they are actually performing better than those people who are on an animal-based food. And recent example is the famous football player, um, Tom Brady, Brady, and you know that he is creating history and he has changed his diet and there are numerous examples. So sky is the limit. There is complete nutrition as long as you plan it well, you eat, add a variety of grains, fruits, legumes and vegetables, you will not be deprived of any uh, uh, nutrition. So I will go with what Milan is saying that eat lots of fruits and vegetables, make millet like millet is such a great example. And when Milan mentioned about cereals that he means to say about grains and these different grains are good source of protein and calcium. And if we bring those variety and if we bring those foods back to our plate and we start eating traditional and start thinking about, are we buying those items which we see as an ad in TV or uh, as a, in a billboard? Or we really want to be a conscious eater and see what is good for us. And once we, uh, we use our wisdom to eat the right food, I think we can really fight uh, these chronic disease problems in India. And final question, Millen, I'm going to come to you for this, as you've also stated that you don't eat packaged foods, you don't eat processed foods, you like to eat fresh food. And so thinking back to perhaps the last time you did eat a processed or, or a packaged food, I mean, can you tell me a difference between how your body feels eating that versus when you do keep things ultra fresh? <laughs> well, first, I'd like to say it's not that I never eat uh, processed or packaged foods. Of course, I do. I mean, when I'm on a run, like I just mentioned, a 300, 400 kilometer run, I have to have packaged foods with me because, you know, you're, you're, you're in a car, you're on a highway. Where do you get fresh food? It's, it's, it's very, very difficult. So it also depends on why you would eat uh, processed and packaged food. I, for me, it's, it's the last resource. You know, it's, it's something that if I couldn't get fresh food, only then would I eat packaged and processed. So when people ask me, okay, what are the do's and don'ts? Of food that you eat for me it's like minimally so i won't say not at all because even cooking is a process and of course we cook uh, but minimally processed minimally packaged minimally refined so this is the way it is and when i say again minimally refined it's like when you eat a banana you peel the banana i mean that's you're refining the banana even though we know that the peel itself has a lot of nutrients in it we cannot digest the peel so we we remove it from the banana so minimally refined, minimally packaged, and minimally processed. I mean, you can't get away from processing and packaging and, and refining completely. But I think it's up to you then to decide 
how to minimize these three things in your life and i think that will uh, that will be something that stands you in great stead and you hear that message zishan and i know you and i earlier were talking about the increasing rates of diabetes and obesity in india matter of fact you just worked hard and earned the middle of our fight diabetes with food program specifically for <laughs> india talk to us a little bit about that of course yes so uh, we are uh, running a 8 week series of uh, fight diabetes with food and what we are trying to show uh, and this is specially designed for people in india and we have uh, for example milan soman uh, presents and malika sharawat and uh, film actor aditi govitrikar who have all been who have all been on plant based diets and they are showing people that look at the power of plant based diet so our idea is bring those experts based in india and uh, in usa and bring them in this live uh, webinar on every thursday at 6:30 pm indian standard time and you can find the registration page at uh, www.fightdiabeteswithfoodindia.org again fightdiabeteswithfoodindia.org there is a registration page it's free and it's on zoom and every week you join for 1 hour 6:30 pm where we talk about how to tackle diabetes with plant based food what we should be doing when we are in a social event or when we are at a party or when we are traveling how we can uh, keep eating plant based diet and what we are seeing is in the program participants in the last series which we did we found that so many people we are able to reverse their diabetes just by participating in this program and hearing the message from experts like dr neil bernard and dr pramod tripathi and there are so many different uh, uh health coaches and chefs who are sharing their ex- expertise and how they are using this kind of approach it's a, li- it's a lifestyle method right so which is away from just writing prescriptions that we are seeing that really doing this intervention lifestyle intervention with a diet can really do the magic so we are seeing amazing results in this uh, uh, program and i would highly recommend all the participants that please uh, we still have another four classes in this series and we will continue of course in in the future but please register at fightdiabeteswithfoodindia.org and then you will get a link to join each week at 6:30 pm on thursday indian standard time and Milan will end with this you hear about those amazing results Zishan was just talking about it got to be pretty inspiring for you to hear about those successes that your fellow countrymen and country women are having yeah it's it is it's fabulous like i said right in the beginning i have people coming to me all the time uh, nowadays saying that you know i lost this much weight and i i reversed i mean even reverse diabetes with food because we have a lot of people already talking about it and it's wonderful to hear that the awareness is catching on otherwise people just don't know what to do i mean there's so much marketing there's so much advertising there's so many people saying that you know scaring you saying that you have to eat this and you have to eat that and if you don't eat this then you know bad things are going to happen but um, we need more uh, programs like this uh, more classes like this more people coming out and speaking about how um, uh, plant based diets have helped them how healthy lifestyles help what does a healthy lifestyle mean um, i mean all those things are very important that everybody should talk about in fact all the time because on the one hand you've got uh, like i said advertising and marketing and so many people selling so many things we need the other side to be equally voluble about you know how to gain wisdom in understanding yourself better All right, you are a fun follow by the way mm-hmm. on Twitter and Instagram at Millen Running. Everybody should definitely go and and follow him. I mean, your adventures are really second to none and I cannot thank you enough for your time today. This has been a whole lot of fun for me. For thank me. you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Zeev Dan. Thank, thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Balanji. This is great. I think uh, we are so thankful to you in spite of your busy schedule. You found time and spoke with you in length with me and Chuck. Really thankful to you. I'm glad. Glad I could be here.
<laughs> and that is, in fact, all the time that we have today. I want to say thank you so very much for watching today about creativity. Hi, we see you. And to all the other exam roomies, thanks for being here to raise your health IQ and to the crew behind the scenes that always makes the magic happen. Thank you guys so very much for making this show possible. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again soon. But until then, keep it plant-based.